Elijah and Elisha, I used this example last week, that when Elijah, the prophet, came to Elisha, found him plowing in the field, got his 12 yoke of oxen, and he says, follow me. And Elisha says, wait a minute, let me say goodbye to my, my parents and let me get my, get my things in order and I'll be right with you. And Elijah said, I'll forget it. And Elisha knew who was with him. Elisha knew that this was the prophet of God. And Elisha got revelation. Like, boom. The light went on. Yeah. She's like, well, I, don't, I don't need to say goodbye. I don't need to get my affairs in order. Matter of fact, you know what? I, I'm, I know who you are. And I know what you're doing. I know you're the prophet. And you're asking me to follow you. I'm going to actually burn and cut off every resource that I've got that would even cause me to look back. I'm going to have nothing to turn back to. I'm going to have nothing to turn back to. And he takes the yoke and he builds a fire. And then he kills the ox and he offers it as a sacrifice. And says, I got nothing to turn back to. How many are willing to do that? How many have done that in their walk with the Lord? Burned all the bridges. Yeah, yeah. I know we're always told in life, don't burn, don't burn your bridges. Well, with God, you ought to burn your bridges. You've heard me say time and time again, there is no plan B with God. There is only plan A. Now, if you mess up, he'll find and direct you another way to fulfill plan A. And if you mess up, he doesn't give you a plan B. He's like, no, do this and do that and turn over here and everything and let me get you back on the road to plan A. <laughs> and if you get off the path again, he'll say, okay, if you take this road and you detour over here, it'll take you right back to plan A. <laughs> it's kind of like when you're driving down the interstate and they're doing construction and it says detour. <laughs> Nobody likes detours. I don't know about you, but I don't like detours. Detours seem to always add miles onto your trip. Amen. Amen. <laughs> And also cause a little anxiety. The other thing detours do sometimes is detours will cause you to think, maybe I know a better way than even the detour. Oh. Say it ain't so. <laughs> but what does the detour do? It just takes you around, but it'll get you back out to the interstate. It'll get you back out to plan A. So even if you take a detour in your walk with God, and you do look back, or you don't shut all the doors. If you repent and turn your heart towards God, he'll detour you back to his plan. Because his plan doesn't change. Thank you, Lord. you can live your whole life and never fulfill his plan. Mm, that's but your whole life he will be trying to get you to walk out his plan. He'll never give up on you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never leave you. Amen. He will always try to direct you back to his plan and his purpose. And you can run from it. There's those that do. There's those that actually get on the path to his plan and then it seems so overwhelming that they jump off the path and they start running because they think it's too much. Well, it's because they start looking at what they do or don't have. They start looking back. They start thinking that maybe what the world had to offer their life before God was better. Maybe they've gotten connected with somebody in their life that's convinced them that their life would be better if they went back to serving the enemy. Now, they, people don't come right out and tell you that. No, 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 no. But they'll present themselves and they'll present things before you. They'll, that there'll be things that'll be presented to you that you'll have to make a choice. We need to be solid in the fact there's nothing better than God. Can, you, can we all agree? There's nothing better than God. <laughs> All the riches this world has to offer, nothing better than God. The biggest house down in Del Mar, La Jolla, not better than God. The best car, not better than God. The greatest title you can carry in this earthly realm, not better than God. Climb the corporate ladder. Be at the very top. CEO. Largest company. Not better than God. President of the United States. 
Not better than God. No. Nothing better than God. No, that's right. Hallelujah. Then why do we chase after things that we think are better than God? I don't know. I can't answer that. But I can say this, that there's nothing better than God. That's right. yeah. Hallelujah. We looked at Abram last week. Abram was told, we saw two times. And until you, unless you really look at scripture, you don't see that. But Abram was told two times to leave his homeland. Why? Because they, they were moon worshipers. They were astrology worshipers. They worshiped the moon and the stars. And idols. Their, their society was full of idolatry. And God said, get out of it. Leave that. Yeah. Genesis chapter 11. End of the chapter into Genesis chapter 12, first one. Acts chapter 7. Stephen talks about that actually the first time that Abram was told to leave Mesopotamia. Well, when he left, he was told to leave and leave everything behind. His family, the whole works. And we can see according to Acts chapter 7 that he didn't do that. That he actually, when he left... And according in, in Genesis chapter 12, it says that he had his father Turan with him. And in Genesis chapter 12, would actually lead you to believe that Turan, his father, was actually leading the situation when that wasn't to be. And while I showed you that the, the name Turan in itself means delayed. The Hebrew meaning of that name is delayed. And they went to the they, they stopped in the city of Haran. And the word name Haran is the name or the Hebrew word parched, which means parched. Which because Abram did not listen and do what God had told him to do at first, he was delayed by taking his father. You'd think, my gosh, that's pretty harsh. When God says do something, do it. It may seem harsh to us. It may not seem right to our mind. But there's a reason why. It's, and it's not because God's trying to take something from you. He's trying to get something to you. Right. God's always trying to get something to you, never trying to take something from you. God's not a taker, he's a giver. Yeah, amen. So whatever he speaks to you about, it may seem like you're going to lose, it may seem like subtraction, but it's not. It's addition, it's multiplication, right. always with God. Right. But because Abram did not listen, he was delayed for 205 years until his father passed away. And then God came and spoke to him and said, again, and said, get out of here. It's a parched land. Leave this parched land. Leave Haran. Remember the meaning, parched land. Yeah. Leave this parched place and go on to the land of Canaan, the land that flows with milk and honey. Wow. Go on to where there's abundance. Yeah. See, when you go, when you follow God and you go where he wants you to go and don't look back and don't disobey, there's abundance. And let me say this. Because sometimes we convince ourselves that this is okay. Partial obedience is still disobedience. I'm going to say that again. Partial obedience is still disobedience. As a kid, you probably figured that out with your parents. They'd tell you to do something and you'd kind of do half of it. And then when they found out that you didn't do the other half or you didn't fit, complete it, did they reward you? And I don't want to make this sound like God rewards us. So to try, I say this treading on thin ice. But did you receive the blessing because you did half? Or did they say, you didn't do what I told you to do? Right. You, and, did you, and, and, and as a kid, if you ever did this, did you try to then negotiate with them? Well, I, I, I did half of it. I, I, I did this over here. They, yeah, but, yeah, but you didn't do this. I told you to do this, this, and this. Yeah, but I did this. No, but I told you to do this, this, and this. Yeah, but, 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 and it's like, no. No. Mm -hmm. Partial obedience is still disobedience. Yeah. See, and Abram felt the effects of that because 205 years he lived in a parched land. He didn't have to. He didn't have to live in a parched land. He could have, when God first spoke to him in Mesopotamia, he could have went right straight through to Haran. But instead he stopped off. Because the person, a person that he brought with him, 
said, this is a good place to set up camp. See, there'll be people in our lives that will tell us, hey, this is a good place to stop. And you've got to really look at it and go, no, it's not a good place to stop. God told me to go here. But they'll say, no, this, this is a good place to stop. It's like, no, it's not a good place to stop because God called me over here. And if you stop, you'll live in a dry, parched land. But see, God still came back and spoke to Abram and said, Come on, get out of here. Get out of here. Get onto the land that flows with milk and honey. See, God knows everything about our lives. Amen. He knows everything about us. And we're going to look at a few things quick here. Talking about not looking back. Turn over to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Psalm 139. We're going to go through a few things here. Thank you, Jesus. God's given us a purpose. And that purpose can only be fulfilled is if we keep our eyes fixed forward looking at him and not looking back. Remember I said, see, he's, God, the Father, is in the light and he said that his light lights our path. And it's really not our path, it's the path that he's prepared for us. It's really his path that he's prepared for us, but it's our path because it's our, he prepared it for us. But he is in the light, and you can only be on the path and follow the path is if you're looking at him, because he lights that path. Right. The problem, I said, I said last week, when we look behind, we can't see the path that's in front of us, which means we don't see the obstacles. See, even in the path, there's obstacles. Right. But when you keep your eyes fixed on God, you'll see those obstacles will be made seen to you. Isn't that good news? Yeah. See, all the tests and all the trials and all the tribulation and all the persecution, the Bible tells us that we're going to have that. But when you keep your eyes fixed on Christ and you're not looking back, but you're looking forward with him, he'll show you all those things. He'll show you those things to come. I mean, you read the life of Paul in the book of Acts. Paul was showing things all the time. Matter of fact, there was somebody that came to Paul towards the end of the book of Acts, somewhere around uh, Acts chapter 20, 21, somewhere in there. I'm not sure exactly sure, but it's, it's towards the end, the last several chapters. And there's somebody that speaks to Paul and says, I saw in a vision that you're going to be bound with a leather belt and, and you're going to be persecuted and you're going to go through some really tough times. So don't go. Now, what would we do in that situation? Be honest with yourself. If someone came to you and said, hey, the Lord just showed me specifically that there's some really tough times ahead of you and you're going to be bound with leather straps. You're going to be beaten. You're going to be whipped. Persecution's coming. It's not going to be pretty. We would probably, in our thinking, go, oh, that's the Lord just warning me. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not going that way. And Paul said, hey, I got no problem with that. I know that's exactly what's going to happen and I'm still going. Come on. Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. <laughs> Paul didn't look back. Philippians chapter 3. You can go read Philippians chapter 3. Write it down if you didn't write it down last week. But Philippians chapter 3, Paul says, I count those things behind as done. I don't consider the, anything of my past worthy. And he says, if there's, if there's anybody that had an opportunity to brag, I got an opportunity to brag. I was the, the, the top echelon, the Pharisee of Pharisees. I was being trained to, to take the position of being the head Pharisee and leading the Israelites in, in the religious law. I kept the law. I kept it. If there's anybody that had a right to break it, Paul says, none of that. None of that. My position, my prestige, my title, nothing I did accounts to anything. The only thing that accounts to anything is Christ in me and him crucified. Yeah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul said, it's not I that lives, but it's Christ in me. Right. 
Say that with me. I don't live. I don't live. But Christ lives in me. Well, that actually means that if you're not living and Christ is the one that lives in you, that means you don't have a say. Mm, come on. You're dead. You're dead to your own plan. You're dead to your own purposes. You're dead to your will. Mm -mm -mm. That means you've turned your life over. That's, see, that's lordship. I died. It's now Christ that lives in me. Don't look back. Looking back will just get you to look at your failures your disappointments. It'll get you to look at the, your life of death because, see, looking back, you were dead. You're dead now, too, but in a different way. You've been crucified with Christ, but you've been raised to new life. But if you look back to your past, you're looking back to a dead man. You're looking back at a dead man. Why would you want to look back at a dead man? The other thing it'll do is you may have some successes in your life before you got saved, and it'll cause pride to rise up. It'll cause, and that's, that's what'll cause people to actually walk away from the goodness of God because they'll look back and see some accomplishments that they had in their life and think, well, you know, I did pretty good after all. When I really think about it and I look back, I was doing pretty good without God. Why in the world do I need him? I mean, I had more money. Because now I tithe and I give and I got nothing. Really? You're storing up riches in heaven. That's a whole lot more than the riches that you're storing up here on this earth where it says moth and rust does corrupt. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be storing things up where moth and rust doesn't corrupt because there's an eternity to live. Yes. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But there's all kinds of people say, you know, if I really look back at things, it appears as if I was better off without serving God. It appears, appears that things were going better. I mean, there was less persecution, there was less tests, there was less trials. Now that I'm serving God, the enemy, I got a target on my back and the enemy just seems to be chasing me down. I don't think I like that. I think I'll go back to not serving God. I'd rather serve God with a target on my back getting hit every day than to live a whole lifetime not serving God and thinking that you're sliding on easy street yeah. because there's a day that's coming. Right. Come on. <laughs> there's a day that's coming where you'll stand before him and give account for not living your life for him or living your life for him. What you've done with the gifts and the talents that he's placed in you. See, he's placed such value upon your life and defined you in such a way that you were created for such a time as this. I'll never forget the, when I got the revelation of that. That God showed me and said, I created you for such a time as this. Which means in all of eternity or in all of the time that this earth has been in existence, God had the ability to place you in a time span of wherever he wanted. And when he gave me the revelation of this is, was probably about 15 years ago, and uh, he started showing me because I was thinking about, man, everything that's going on in the earth and, you know, how difficult life can be sometimes and wars and rumors of wars and all the nasty stuff going on and everything like that. And he just showed me, he says, yeah, and you know what? I chose you for right now. And then he began to tell me, he says, the reason why I chose you for right now is because I placed within you the, be able, the ability to be able to change some things and do some things spiritually that nobody else can do. Come on. Come on. Because I actually used to think to myself, man, wouldn't it have been cool to live back in the Western days or even back in the 30s? I was, as a kid, and even before I got saved, I was kind of mesmerized by the 30s and the 40s and the whole uh, organized crime syndicate type thing and mafia that was going on back then and I would watch movies and I'd even read stuff about it and I was just like and, and I know why it was is because there's a a false sense but there's a picture of honor amongst thieves right and that that it looked very intriguing to me it was just like wow you know I mean they they got each other's back and if yeah. you cross that it's like that's not a good thing and I was just mesmerized so I always thought to myself and then realized that no oh, that's that's just a false sense of honor it's a false picture of what God really intended. And he's like, no, if I'd have wanted you back then, I'd have put you back then. But I put you in the time that you're in right now because there's some things that can only be accomplished in the lifespan that you've got here on this earth that you can do. Right. Because I put the plan and the purpose of God on the inside of you to accomplish them. See, you're here not by accident. Right. Hallelujah. 
You're here because the plans and purposes of God that he put on the inside of you are to accomplish some things right now today in this day and age. Yeah. And it's not to go to work nine to five. Amen. Come, on. Come on. It's not even to just get married and live the American dream, have a house, two kids, a dog, and a car, and wait till you turn 62 or 65, and then you can say, I'm retired, living the good life. No, he created you for a whole lot more. That's not the prize. That's not the prize. That's right. Amen. But yet we sometimes even carry that into the church thinking the prize is, is work our 30 or 40 years, build up our retirement so we can say we don't have to work anymore. Now we can sit back and live, and that's like, ha, I've attained. I've arrived. I accomplished everything. It's like God's like, no, you didn't. <laughs> Because if retirement in our society is looked at as 62, 65, some work a little bit longer than that, but it's usually around that 62 or 65 mark, and God says that I promise you 120 years, sounds to me like you only made it halfway, you still got half a life to live. How could you arrive at 60 when you still got 60 left? What are you going to do with the last 60 if you've arrived in the first 60? I don't think you've arrived. Don't look back. Don't look back. Y'all over at Psalm 139? Yeah. <laughs> Woo, thank you, Jesus. Thank Glory to God. God's got a plan for you, amen? Yeah. Psalm 139, I'm going to go through some things here just briefly and uh, show you four points. This is very interesting. Psalm 139, we're going to start out with the first point, verses 1 through 6, that God knows you. God knows you. He said, God knows you. <laughs> Let's start reading verses 1 through 6. It says, O oh Lord, this is David talking. O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. David, right off the bat, says, man, you've searched me and you know me. Yeah. You know me better than I know myself. Yeah. <laughs> you might as well own up to the fact that God knows you better than you know you. <laughs> Amen. It goes on to say, thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my line down and are acquainted with all my ways. He's acquainted with all your ways. He made you. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. <laughs> Glory to God. Verse 4, For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high, I cannot attain unto it. God knows us. In those six verses, he kind of pretty much explains right there, there's not a single thing about you I don't know. Wow. Awesome. And David's saying, my gosh, where can I hide from you? I can't go anywhere. That's why we think, look, I, uh, talking about not looking back, we think if we go back, we can kind of escape. I'll go back to the way I used to live. I'll just escape from this whole God thing. No, <laughs> you ain't escaping from him. <laughs> Come on. Matter of fact, going back is really going back to live in darkness because you're in light, and if you turn around and go back, you're going back to live in darkness. And God says there, that David says, God knows me in the dark places and in the light places. Yeah. Because God never leaves you nor forsakes you. So even if you turn to go back and to live in the dark places, God's with you and God shines the light on it and says, ha, I see ya. <laughs> <laughs> and we kind of turn to go back another way. It was like, man, I'll get over here. And it's like, the light comes with and it says, ha, I see ya. <laughs> and David's saying, how do I get out of this? How do I get away from him? I don't understand everywhere I go, everything I say, everything I do, everything about me. He is well acquainted with me. He knows everything there is about me. But yet he still loves you. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, the end of the chapter, it goes on, it talks about that nothing can separate us from his love which means all those little quirky things that may still try to arise in your flesh. See, we're talking about your spirit, man, versus your flesh not looking back. Your flesh is what wants to look back. Right. And if you allow your flesh to look back, yeah. your flesh, if you allow it to do that, takes your spirit with you. Yeah. See, your spirit can't be over here and your flesh over here. Yeah, yeah. Amen. 
And even though all the little quirky things about you, God still loves you. Yes, thank God. Even though you make wrong decisions, God still loves you. Even though you may sin, God still loves you. Even though you may say some wrong things, God still loves you. <laughs> Even though you may chase after some things, God still loves you. Thank you Lord. Chase after some things that you ought not be chasing after. Because somewhere in the, in the process of life, you, you still identify yourself with things. Prestige, titles, who you know, who you don't know. I mean, I'll, let's all be honest. We love to throw names around sometimes. We meet somebody, you know, meet somebody that's got a name, somebody in ministry, maybe somebody at a party, you know, just a, a work party or whatever. But we get introduced to somebody. And how many, how many know that you like to throw that name out when you go talk to someone? You, guess, guess who I met last night? Come on. Jesus? That should be our response. Jesus? Oh, no, no, no. I talked I talk to so-and-so. And? And? Does that person know Jesus? <laughs> Come on. All those things, and he still loves us. But verse 5 tells us, it says, Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. Thou hast beset me behind and before and had laid thy hand upon me. Now, we've got to understand what David is saying here. This is Old Testament. In the Old Testament, when the father laid his hand on a child... It was a blessing that was being bestowed upon him. David is saying here, even though you know all my little intricacies and all my little quirks and all my little wrongs and all this and all that and everything, you still put your hand upon me and bestow blessing upon me. That's how much God loves you. Why do we want to look back to what the world has to offer when we look forward and God lays his hands on us? Why are we concerned about all the things that we used to have when we look forward and God lays his hands on us and he blesses us? See, that blessing gave us position, give, in the Old Testament, meant position in the family. It meant inheritance. David is saying here, even though you know all my little quirks, even though you know everything about me, the good and the bad, the ugly, the dirty, you know all these things about me. You know my past, you know my future, you know my present, you know what I'm going to do before I even do it. And even though you know all these things about me, you lay your hand on me and you say, blessed. You're my son. Blessed, you're my daughter. A high position you hold in my household and in the family of God. A high position and a great inheritance you are to receive because you're my child. Oh, regardless of the difficult things in our lives. But yet we look back thinking there's things they offer. No, no, no. Verse 6 going to say, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it's too high, I cannot attain unto it. He gives us his grace to be able to make it through. We can't attain. That's why he's given us grace. David says, all these things are too high for me to attain. And God says, like, I know they are. That's why I'm with you. I know you can't attain them on your own. I know you can't live this life on your own. I know you can't walk this walk with me by yourself. Remember, I gave you the Ten Commandments. I gave you all the commandments to show you that you couldn't. And then I gave you Jesus to show you that you can. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. Yeah. I gave you grace. Yeah. I gave you Jesus. Yeah. Now you can. Yeah. Don't ever say you can't. Don't say I can't pray. I can't speak. I can't speak the word. I can't serve. I can't do this. I can't. Yes, you can. If you really have an understanding of the, what he gave you and he gave you grace, you can do anything. It ought to cause all of us to want to jump up and say, what can I do? Yeah, what can I do to serve? What can I do to go forward? What can I do to demonstrate Jesus? What can I do? What can I do? Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. The second thing. The second thing is, is God pursues us. God pursues us. Verses 7 through 12. It says, after David saying, man, you know everything about me. Oh, my gosh. I just don't understand this. He goes on to say, whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light to me. Verse 12 Yes, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. So David starts out by saying, you know everything there is about me. You know me better than I know myself. You know me better than my spouse knows me. You know, better, know me better than my kids know me. You, knew me, you know me better than my, my, my flesh and blood parents know me. Mm -hmm. There's nobody that knows me better than you. You know the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> and then David goes on to say, verses 7 through 12, you not only know me all those things, you won't let me hide from you. Yes. See, this is all such a great thing because God says, even though I know everything about you, I know all the little bad things, all the little good things, all the little quirky things, all the little things that are a little bit off kilter, all the things that you, try, that you think you're doing in secret. <laughs> I'm right there. Why? Because I love you. I love you. You can't do anything too bad to get me to stop loving you. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, while we were yet sinners, he loved us. Mm -hmm. right. I don't know why. I've been, in the, been here before. I don't know why. It seems like after we get saved, we think when we mess up that all of a sudden it's just like, oh, no. But the Bible tells us if we keep Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, He loved us while we were yet sinners. While you were at your worst. If He loved you while you were at your worst, and He paid the greatest price while you were at your worst, and He loved you with an unfailing love while you were at your worst, is there anything you can do now as His child that would stop Him from loving you or cause Him to have a little hiccup and go, now wait just a minute here. But people go through that all the time. There's people in the body of Christ right now that are not serving God because they had a hiccup in their life. And they forgot that God loved them while they were yet sinners. And they're not a sinner any longer. Right. And then they're convinced that the sinning world loves them more than God does. So they look back and they go back to darkness. They go back to the sinning world. They turn away from God. But yet they really, they think they're turning away from God. But the Bible says that God never leaves us nor forsakes us. So no matter if they, stay, they feel like they're turning from God, wherever they go, they're going to see God. That's why, if you've ever heard, a backslidden person is the most miserable person in the world. Because once you've seen and tasted the things of God, and once you've got God living in your life, God shows up everywhere. And it's miserable running from God. It's miserable because you go over here and God's there. And you try to run over here and God's there. And you run over here, and God's there. And you run over here, and God's there. And it's like, no, over here, oh my gosh, God's there. I'm going over here, and oh my gosh, God's there. But you can begin to harden yourself where you stop seeing God. But God sees your every move, yet he still loves you. Even when you're running from, them, from him like that, he still loves you. That's why he never leaves you nor forsakes you, because he's always hopeful. Just like the father was with the prodigal son, he is always hopeful that you will come to yourself and you will come back to him and just humble yourself. And you won't come back being a servant just like the son that came back wasn't being a servant. The son came back and took his position back in the home as a son. And the father put the ring on his finger and put the robe and killed the fatted calf and rejoiced. My son has returned. 
I don't care how far down the path you go. I don't care how much you turn back. God places a value upon you that when you humble yourself and you turn from the things that you're doing, you turn from what you may be doing, you turn from running back and looking back, God will put the ring back on your finger. God will put the robe of righteousness back around you and cleanse you from all of your wrongdoing and everything you might have been messing around with. And he'll say, you are not a servant. You are my son. You are my blood. There's no, there's nothing that you could do that will ever erase the fact that my blood flows through, you, flows through your veins and you are my son and you are my daughter. You will always be a member of the family. Nothing you've done can separate you from that. And you'll not have to go through punishment to get back into that place. You notice when the son come back, he didn't have to serve some type of penance. The father didn't say, well, I appreciate your humbleness. And you know the very fact that, that you lived out there squandering away your inheritance and living out there in righteous living, probably shacking up with some women, doing some things you ought not do, crowsing and getting drunk, maybe getting high with your buddies. I, I, all those things that you probably did. And you know what? The fact that you did them, you know, you are my son, but I think you ought to just live in the servant's quarters for about six months to a year just so you can pay a little penance and, and understand. Sit and think. You ever been told that by a parent? I want you to just sit and think about what you've done. This son thought about what he did. That's why he came back. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we don't need to, when we do something wrong, don't really need to sit and think about what we've done. We know what we've done. We just need to humbly come back and say, Father, forgive me. And he's like, the minute we do, he places us back in that position yeah. of sonship, of daughtership Hallelujah. immediately. It's not like, well, you know, do this, do that. Get this taken care of. Get that taken care of. Then I'll let you back in the house. But until the meantime, sleep out on the patio. Yeah, that's a good thing. We'll, we'll set a tarp up so the rain don't get on you. But sleep on the patio. And when you get some things in order and you pay the price and pay a little penance here, then your bedroom is still in there. We didn't change anything. Your bedroom's still there. The bed's still there. Everything's the way it was when you left, but you don't get to go back into that bed till you take care of some things. Mm. No, the father says, hey, <laughs> your bed's still there. Climb on in. Get a good night's sleep. Rest in me. Rest knowing that I love you, yeah. and what you did doesn't define you. Right. Whose family you're in defines you, yeah. and you're in my family, yeah. and that's what defines you, and that's what places value upon you. Thank you. Verse 10 tells us, it says, Even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. God is always leading us and always guiding us or desiring to lead us in the guidance, no matter where we go, no matter how far down the road of darkness we can travel, no matter how much we may turn back, if we do turn back, he's always leading us and guiding us. There's nothing about you where God will not lead and guide you. His desire is to lead and to guide your life. He's got a plan and a purpose for you. All throughout scripture, we continue to see he calls us his beloved, he calls us his chosen, he calls us his dearly loved children. All throughout scripture. Yeah. That's who we are to him. We are his beloved. We are his chosen. Yeah. We are his dearly loved children. Glory. He'll never stop leading us. He'll never stop guiding us. Amen. The Bible tells us over in Matthew chapter 10 verses 29 through 31. It talks about the sparrow. If one sparrow falls to the ground, God knows it. Do you think God places more value on a sparrow than you? Which means if you stumble, he knows it. And he's there to pick you back up. Right. Hallelujah. He doesn't leave you where you're at. No. Aren't you glad God doesn't leave you where you're yes. at? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Because of the value he places upon your life. The third thing is, we're talking, reading this Psalm 139 here. God himself made you. God himself made you. Verses 13 through 16. Let's go on reading. So first God says, I know everything there is to know about you. 
Then the second thing is, is God says, I'm going to do whatever it takes to pursue you. I know where you are, and I'm not going to stop pursuing you. I'm not going to ch stop chasing after you, no matter what you're mine. And you'll always be mine. I paid the greatest price that I could pay for you. And I will search for you and look for you as of a valuable pearl, as of gold, as of a diamond. I will continue to pursue you and chase after you because I know how valuable you are. You can't get too far away from me where I'll stop chasing. You can't go too far down the path of darkness where I'll say, okay, I'm not going any farther than that. Do you know that God will not reach a point where he'll say, mm, I'm not going any further than that, man. Hey, they've gone as far as they can. So he'll go to the depths of wherever you go to try and pull you back out. He'll go to the darkest places. He'll go to the deepest spots. He'll go wherever he needs to go to try and pull you out of where you're at because of how much he loves you and the value that he places upon you. You can't go too far. You can't go too deep. You can't backtrack too much where God will not reach forth with his hand and try to pull you out of where you're at because of the value that he's placed upon you. He paid too great a price to leave you where you are. I said he paid too great a price to leave you where you're at. Do you see yourself that way? Do you see yourself that way? But God himself made you. Verse 13. It says, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's room. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members are written, which is continuance, were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Now I'm going to read that out of the New Living. I love the New Living for this part. But you notice what David's doing here? David starts out with, he's starting out as a poor me situation. He's just like, oh my gosh, I've messed up. You know everything there is about me. I just, oh gosh, Lord, how can I get away from you? You know all the bad things about me. You know all the ugly things about me. And oh, and how many have ever felt that way or know somebody that's felt that way? It's just like, oh, you just don't understand. And they get in the pity part. And you don't understand what I've done. And you don't understand what I've gone through. And you don't understand the bad things that I've I've done. If you knew the bad things I've done, you wouldn't love me. And if you wouldn't love me, I know God wouldn't love me. And that David is saying, you know everything there is about me. And he's like, oh my gosh, how can I get away from you? Because I'm an unworthy man. You just know it all. And I'm just unworthy. And then God goes on to say, yeah, but I know, I know all those things, but it doesn't make any difference because my grace and my mercy is upon you and I'm reaching out to you. And then, and then David goes on to say, oh my gosh, how can I get away from you? Just, oh, just stay away. I mean, that's, that's the way we can be somebody. God, you just, just stay away from me. I'm, I'm unworthy. I'm, I'm not worthy of you. I'm not worthy of anything you've done. I'm not worthy of the blood of Christ. I'm not worthy of anything that you've done. And God says, no, 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 no. Come here. Come here. You're my son. You're my daughter. You can't get away from me. And then all of a sudden, something starts to change in David. David's just like, you made me. You do know everything about me. And I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. See, revelation starts to come to David now. He's just like, you began to knit me together before I was even in my mother's womb. I'm going to read it out of the New Living. New Living. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body, verse 13, and knit me together in my mother's womb. Knit me together. See, this is a picture David is saying of, of somebody that, that makes intricate clothing, just the intricacies of all the fibers coming together and, and, and everything coming together. He says, you knit me together in my mother's womb. You put me together. He says, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Now David starts to see, he's just like, man, you, do, you really did, you, you're something. How you made me. You, you put me all together. You got a plan for me. That's what God is telling him. He says, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous in how well I know it. See, David's whole attitude's starting to change now. He says, you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the darkness of the womb. You saw me before I was born. See, that's what we got to understand. God's like, 
I knew you before you were born. Before you came out into this natural realm and started messing some things up, I knew you because I'm the one that made you. And I didn't make you to mess up. Now, I understand you got tied up in some things, and I understand you were born into darkness. But you know what? I made a way for you to come out of that place of darkness and come back into the place of light. I've made a way through Christ, through my Son, that you can now begin to walk out and live the purposes that I put in you before you were even before, before you were born, before you were in your mother's womb. I put a plan, and I put a purpose on the inside of you. And even though I knew that you were going to be born into this earth, and you were going to have have some difficulties and you were going to do and say some things that you shouldn't have done and you shouldn't have said and you're going to hang around with some people you shouldn't have hung around with and you're going to experiment with some things you shouldn't have experimented with. That, that has no bearing on it because I don't look at the things that you did during this that period of time upon the earth. I see you the way I made you and I made you fearfully and wonderfully made. I made you very intricate. I made you to be a doer of the word. I made you to be a son or a daughter. My daughter, I made you to be part of my family. I made you so I could be your heavenly father. I made you so you could accomplish some things in this earth that nobody else can accomplish. I made you with a purpose that only you can fulfill. Nobody else can fulfill. I made you in such a way that you are a one of a kind. I have need of you. I have need of what you can do because I put within you for such a time as this to accomplish the things that I said you can do and only you can do. You are one of a kind. You are a masterpiece. Glory to God. You're a masterpiece. You're a one of a kind. There's no duplicates. There's no blueprints to make another one like you. (laughs) Hallelujah. Even you will. You've got a twin, but he ain't like you. He may look like you. There may even be a few characteristics that seem like you're just alike, but you ain't alike because God's got a plan for you. God's got a plan for your brother. You are both completely different. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, and what he's got for you is so much different than what he's got for your brother, but the two of you, he's got a plan for both of you, and it's a plan to succeed. It's a plan to go over. It's a plan to accomplish well beyond what you can even think or imagine. It's even a plan that accomplished more than any of the knowledge that you're obtaining right right now in college. College is a good thing, but don't underestimate the power of God and the knowledge of God working in your life because what you take in natural and apply God the supernatural to it and you'll succeed and do things that everybody will sit back and go, my gosh, who is that young man? Hallelujah. And that's for each one of us. I don't care if you were a stay-at-home mom. I don't care if you were just a mailman. There's nothing wrong with being just a mailman because you came across people's lives that none of us ever came across. You got to share Jesus with people that none of us shall ever get to share Jesus with. You got to represent Jesus in situations that none of us will get to represent Jesus in. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I don't care what profession profession you've had or what profession you haven't had. I don't care what title you held or what title you haven't held. I don't care how big your bank account is or if you're both busted and disgusted. It doesn't make any difference. Hallelujah. Because God has got a plan for you and a purpose for you. And through all of that, you can still show Jesus. That's why Paul said, I've learned to be content in every situation. Because his situation didn't determine whether or not he was successful. His situation did not determine whether or not God would use him. His situation did not determine whether or not his witness was good for Jesus Christ. His situation did not determine whether or not he was a child of God. But many times we'll think, well, I can't share because I'm not this yet. Or I can't do this because I've not done that yet. Or I can't do this for God because I haven't been saved long enough. Or I can't do this for God because I was never called to preach. I can't do that. I can't. I can't. I can't. Can't, we ought to remove the word can't out of our vocabulary as a, bro, as a, as a child of God. There is no such word as can't. Right. Hallelujah. You got the one who can live it on the inside of you. Yes. You got the one that says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens yes, you. Yes, yes. If he says you can do all things, then who are you to say you can't? Amen. Who are you to say I won't?
The only one that can put the brakes on God, what he wants to do is you. You can either get on board and say, I can, or you can get off board and say, I can't. Come on. Hallelujah. The fourth thing. God has plans just for you. God has plans just for you. Verses 16, 17, and 18. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which is continuous, were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Verse 17. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me. Wow. David saying, how precious, how wonderful, how extraordinary, how amazing. Whatever word you want to put on it, David is saying, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. Well, just the word sum in itself means that God just doesn't think one thought about you. Sum means that he's accumulating them and summing them all up into one thing is, you're great. You're awesome. You are the most valuable possession to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the awesome thing about the awesomeness of God is he can say that to every one of us. Yes. You're the most valuable thing. Yes. I'm his favorite, Mark. Has the ability to say that about each one of us. How can he do that? I don't know. But he does. When he looks at me, he says, you're my favorite. When he looks at Mark, he says, oh, you're my favorite. When he looks at Duncan, he says, oh, you're my favorite. He looks at Susie, he says, oh, man, you're my favorite. He looks at Nathan, he says, Nathan, you're it, man. You're the cat's meow. You're everything. You are everything to me, man. Hallelujah. When he looks at you, Miguel, he says, you are it. You are it, man. You may be young, but you're it. You're, you're everything. Oh, my gosh, there's none like you. Hallelujah. He can say that about every one of us. Every one of us. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Lord spoke to me when I was praying last night. And he says, Mark's going to say some of these things. Just let him say them. It makes him feel better. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all right, brother. <laughs> Hallelujah. But don't look back. There's nothing about looking back that can cause you to go forward. Good or bad. Good or bad. Now I'm going to have Will play a YouTube thing. You may have heard something similar to this, maybe heard someone preach the message, but I couldn't.